Welcome to this live event honoring Ida B. Wells. This is one in a series of six events hosted by the Center for the Study of the American South in collaboration with other campus units and community partners, including the Chapel Hill Carborough NAACP and the Orange County Community Remembrance Coalition. The Orange County Community Remembrance Coalition is a collaboration of local organizations and individuals committed to disrupting structural racism through truth-telling and hard conversation to achieve community healing and justice for all. No single person has contributed more to addressing the horror of racial terror lynching in this country than Ida B. Wells emphasizing the importance of courageous journalism in moving us forward in our quest for a more equitable and just society. We hope you enjoy this live event. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on your Saturday morning. This is a standing room only crowd in terms of our virtual world. And on behalf of the Center for the Study of the American South at UNC, I welcome all of you. Before I briefly introduce myself, I want to start with a short but important statement, especially as we head into the voting booth. A free press is one of the centerpieces of a true democracy. Ida B. Wells understood the importance of a free press the real dangers of voter intimidation and the type of hard work investigative reporting that under, underpins democracy by shining a light on ugly truths about power. For this work, which she did at the risk of her own life, Ida B. Wells this year was posthumously awarded a Pulitzer Prize. It is very fitting that our panel today also includes a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for her leading work on the 1619 Project, which opened public dialogue about the nature of our nation's infrastructure. My name is Melinda Maynard Lowry. As a professor of history at UNC and the director of the Center for the Study of the American South, I am proud to launch our month long virtual series, Ida B. Wells as journalist, advocate, and educator, honoring the work of Ida B. Wells. I'm even more proud that the Center is hosting these webinars in collaboration with our campus and community partners including the Ida B. Wells Society, founded here at UNC in the Husband School of Journalism and Media. I think it is safe to say that Ida B. Wells would be proud this morning to see our list of keynote speakers, all award-winning investigative journalists. Our moderator will introduce these veteran reporters who continue to carry on the work of Wells, not only by uncovering and sharing the truth, but also by mentoring the next generation of African-American journalists. Introducing our panel this morning is Dr. Joseph Jordan, director of UNC's Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History, an adjunct associate professor of African and African American and Diaspora Studies. His work focuses on social justice movements in the diaspora and the cultural politics of race, identity, and artistic production in the, di in the diaspora. Director of the Stone Center for nearly two decades, Dr. Jordan previously served as director of the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American Culture and History, associate professor and founding chair of African American and African Studies at Antioch College, and associate professor at Xavier University of Louisiana, and assistant professor of human ecology at Howard University. He currently serves on the boards of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora and the Stagville State Historic Site Foundation. He is chair of the Historic Preservation Commission of Durham, North Carolina, and a founding board member and current advisory member of Our Children's Place for the Children of Incarcerated Mothers. He also serves on the editorial advisory boards of the Black Scholar, the Journal of Black Studies and Research, and of PLA ARA, publication of the Afro, Afro Latin American Research Association. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Jordan. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'm actually uh, want to echo some of your words and 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 being very very pleased 
and happy that we do have a standing room um, only audience on a Saturday morning, which uh, I think for this kind of uh, project and this kind of program is uh, merited and warranted. I have a very, um, a, a very happy job of introducing uh, our panelists. And I can tell you that what I want to do uh, is unlike what's happened in some recent uh, events, be as unobtrusive as possible and make sure that uh, our panelists get an opportunity uh, to fully respond to some of the questions that you uh, may have sent in or may decide to send in during the, the program. Uh, with us, of course, as uh, Melinda has stated, are three of the founders of the Ida B. Wells Society. Uh, first, we have with us Nicole Hannah-Jones. Nicole Hannah-Jones is a correspondent for the New York Times Magazine where she focuses on racial injustice. She is also the arch architect, pardon me, of the New York Times 1619 project for which she received the 2020 Pulitzer Prize of which Melinda spoke earlier. She has written on federal failures to enforce the Fair Housing Act, the resegregation of American schools and policing in America. Hannah Jones received the National Magazine Award, a Peabody Award, and a Polk Award for her extensive reporting on the ways that segregation is maintained through official action and policy. She is also a MacArthur Foundation Fellow. She holds a Bachelor's in History and African American Studies from the University of Notre Dame, and also a Master's in Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, and I, I would say to you as I start out, uh, uh, all of our panelists are very, very, very uh, much lettered and awarded individuals. And what you're gonna hear is a fairly truncated version of all that they've done, but, uh, but be assured, um, we would almost take up the entire program if we went over all of the kinds of things that are, they've done uh, to enrich us both through their work and, and through their accomplishments. Uh, our next panelist is Ron Nixon. Ron is the International Investigations Editor at the Associated Press, and is a co-founder, of course, of the Ida B. Wells Society. He manages a team of reporters based in London, Cairo, New Delhi, Shanghai, and Washington. He also works very closely with Associated Press reporters around the globe to conduct ambitious investigative and accountability reporting on a variety of topics. Previously, he was the Homeland Security Correspondent for the New York Times. He has also reported from Rwanda, Uganda, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Belgium, Kenya, Canada, Senegal, Mexico, South Africa, Nigeria, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, we can see, of course, here, Ron is actually living the life that all of us would like to, to live. He wrote the book, Selling Apartheid, Apartheid South Africa's Global Propaganda War, and co-founded two major news-related startups. One. Uh, the Ujima Project, and the other, truthbetold.news. He is currently a visiting associate for journalism and media studies at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. And finally, we have joining with us one of the other uh, co-founders. Topher Sanders covers race, inequality, and the justice system for ProPublica. In 2019, he was part of a team that was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for public service. But he also, at the same time, won the Peabody and George Polk Award uh, for coverage of President Trump's family separation policy. In fact, that, of course, uh, was with the, the team that he worked with there. In 2018, he and reporter Ben Karnak received Columbia University's Tabenkin Award for outstanding reporting on race and at the same time, the University of Colorado's Al Nakula Award for Outstanding Police Reporting for their multi-part investigation, Walking While Black. That investigation also earned them a Deadline Club Award, a National Association of Black Journalists Salute to Excellence Award, and the Florida Society of News Editors Gold Medal for Public Service. In 2017, Topher and colleague Ryan Gabrielson, excuse me, received the John J. College Harry Frank Guggenheim, Guggenheim Award for Excellence in Criminal Justice Reporting and an Aronson Award for Social Justice Journalism for their multi-part series, Busted. 
which was an investigation of the systematic misuse of roadside chemical field tests by police. Uh, so please join me. Uh, there's also what I would call this, this virtual uh, audience applause. So we're gonna ask you to, to join me in welcoming all of our panelists. And we're gonna get started as soon as we bring them on screen. Welcome all. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, let me give you a little bit of a, uh, for the audience, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, to, to first do our studio uh, questioning and engagement with our uh, panelists and, and co-founders, and then we're going to open it up. We're going to bring uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lowry back on to help us uh, manage questions that may be coming in from the field. So, so let's begin this way. Of course, everyone wants to, to get a better understanding of uh, you know what it was that uh, that 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 sort of created this 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 idea within the founders that uh, something like the Ida B. Wells Society was needed. But I think the first thing people would really like to to, to understand a little bit more after under, after getting a sense of how much she's done, why is it that someone who is as accomplished uh, as Ida B. Wells has taken so long to be recognized. Why is it that uh, in, in history, uh, we don't find her uh, as prominently uh, recognized as some of the other folks uh, that we associate with anti-lynching and, uh, and, and some of the kind of journalism that she engaged in? Why don't we start with you, Nicole? And, and throughout this, uh, for Topher and Ron, if you, if you wanna join in and, and add to a particular answer, please do so. Please, Nicole. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Jordan, for that introduction, and thank you for everyone who somehow decided to get up on a Saturday morning to hear us talk. Um, I will say I would be still in bed if I wasn't having to talk to y'all, so I appreciate that you guys all got up for this. Um, so, I mean, the answer is pretty easy. Ida B. Wells is a Black woman, and she kind of sat at the vector of discrimination and marginalization being uh, a black woman, marginal, a black person marginalized by race, and then a woman who was marginalized by her gender, including uh, by black men. So because of that, she was, uh, you know, while she was alive, there were attempts to push her aside from the suffragist movement, to push her aside of the uh, civil rights movement. She was a co-founder of the NAACP, but kind of written out of that history. She was the reason the NAACP even began to pay attention to lynchings and has been largely you know, ignored in that history. So I think what, um, what happened to Ida B. Wells is what happened to a lot of black women who were advocating for suffrage, uh, who were advocating for civil rights is because they are, you know, again, at that vector of marginalization, their legacies have largely been obscured by uh, both black men and white society. Uh, so, of course, in recent years, there's been a great deal of effort to really um, shine a light on her ongoing legacy. And that's one of the reasons that we ultimately, when we decided to found this organization, decided we wanted to name the organization after Ida B. Wells uh, to help uplift that legacy and to show that there has been, you know, she was an innovator of investigative reporting techniques and that we actually have a long tradition as Black Americans of doing this type of work. Anything, Ron, that, or Topher, that you'd like to add to that? No, that was excellent. No. <laughs> okay, I agree, absolutely. So, so the, I guess the follow-up to that is, is that, uh, uh, and, and we actually do have some questions from outside uh, uh, before this uh, uh, panel began. So we wanna go back to something that someone asked that I, I thought was very interesting. How do you think, and, and given the ways that she worked, I mean, we know it was extraordinary for her to be able to move around and do some of the things she did in a period of time with, with, uh, with all of the kind of barriers, as Nicole has, has pointed out, that were placed in front of her. So given what we're seeing now, how do you think she would respond? What kinds of things uh, do you think she would uh, uh, do in order to meet? What would be kind of her, uh, you know, her number one issues? I know there are a lot, but let's, let's kind of think of uh, what it would be that would sort of motivate her to act. Um, if I could take a stab at that. Please, 
I think that, um, you know, she would certainly be focused in on um, one of the, the most um, prominent issues right now is the um, disproportionate killing of Black people by law enforcement. Um, you know, Ida B. Wells was a, as Nicole mentioned, a, an innovator um, and one of the originators of what we call investigative reporting, but she was also an innovator and originator of what we called uh, data journalism today, too. And, and to be able to show that these issues are systemic, not just episodic image, uh, not just episodic where you have one person killed or, or two people killed, but to show the systemic racism that exists uh, throughout society. Uh, this is core to her, her work. And I think that that is something that she would be, be key on today if she were alive. Yeah, if I could add, I mean, one, uh, police killings are is the, the grandchild of lynchings. We know that, that uh, lynchings were often committed uh, with the participation of law enforcement, that, or at least the acquiescence of law enforcement. And, uh, you know, Ida B. Well said, the people who commit the murders write the reports. Well, that's, that's true today. Police and law enforcement are charged with investigating themselves when they kill Black men. And, and in the end, or Black people, uh, Black children, women, and men, and in the end, it's still uh, a matter of an extrajudicial killing of a Black person often being uh, accused of committing some minor infraction uh, who ultimately uh, meets their demise without a warrant of arrest, of trial, of, of a jury uh, deciding that they were guilty. So you can very easily trace those same things and much the way the Ida B. Wells created kind of the first database of lynchings to be able to say, this is how many lynchings are occurring. Uh, these are the causes. These are the reasons, but these are the causes. Uh, we've had journalists, for instance, the Washington Post and other groups that had to actually compile the racial data on police killings because it didn't actually uh, exist all in one place. So I think that there is a direct uh, legacy between the work of Ida B. Wells and what we see now. And what I'd also just add quickly, Ida B. Wells never worked on just one thing, never. Right. Um, she was always focused on multiple things. Again, getting women the right to vote, um, civil rights for Black Americans in general, law, uh, lynchings, and definitely also on uh, trying to uh, uplift uh, poor Black Americans who were moving from the South and pushing back against kind of the, the classist notions of, of many Black Chicagoans and Black Northerners when Black people were coming to the South. So I don't think she'd be working on any one issue. She'd be focusing on multiple issues like she always did. And if I could just add to that, um, I think in specific as it relates to the kind of governmental sponsored killing of, of Black Americans, uh, I'd be Wells would be focused on you know, getting to the heart of the accountability of that. So not only would it be about the events themselves, but she'd be uh, hard pressed to get into side these prosecutor, prosecutor offices and kind of exposing the injustices about the decision making, about not finding anyone accountable. So there's an incident, but then on the back end, no one's held accountable for any of these killings. I believe Ida B. Wells would have that uh, near the top of her agenda. Right. Yeah, I mean, she, I think a lot about, uh, when these lynchings were investigated, uh, which of course was not that common, but when they were, uh, the decision ultimately, the conclusion would be that the lynchings occurred at the hands of persons unknown. So no one could be found responsible. And that certainly is the case today that we, we oft sometimes don't even learn the names of the officers who have committed these killings. Their records can be hidden. And when there are no indictments and no consequences for the killings, we are basically saying no one is guilty of this crime. And that's the same exact thing that was occurring back then. And she was trying to expose, actually there, we do know the people who did this and I'm going to try to name them. Exactly. Uh, can I ask one of you to do something? And I know uh, a, a good number of people in the audience are journalists or uh, students uh, in journalism. You, you mentioned the term data journal journalism, excuse me. Yes. Can you kind of sort of break that down for people who may not have a sense, a full sense of what that means? Yes. Um, data journalism is basically taking records electronically and analyzing them to, to come to conclusions about, you know, systemic problems. Uh, an example is uh, Nicole just mentioned the uh, Washington Post uh, police uh, shootings database that was put together. Uh, Wesley Lowry, who's one of our, our, our members, um, 
along with other uh, people at the post, put that together because there was no uh, record of police shootings in, in the uh, United States. Uh, no government agency was responsible for keeping it. But essentially what you're doing is either creating a database or a spreadsheet of information or taking that spreadsheet of information that was created by a government entity and analyzing it. Uh, so that instead of me looking at one record at a time, I can look at hundreds or thousands or millions of records and be able to see patterns that are not visible uh, if you're simply looking at just a bunch of paper records. So think of it as having a big file cabinet and being able to turn all of that information, uh, all that data into information. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, now that that you know that vision for 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 you as founders, and I guess the the additional folks that have, have come in um, have begun to to add to uh, the vision of the project. What happens next? Where do you see the project going, or what are your intentions uh, in terms of where you want to to take the project? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have grand plans. Uh, for this. You know, this is such a this is such a broad question, I know. But uh, if you'll pick an area where you feel uh, that there's some some good work going on right now, and you're you're moving ahead, let's let's do that for you. Let's make it easy. Uh, what is it right now that you're really excited about in terms of the project? Yeah, uh, there's a couple of things. Um, one is uh, we on. Hopefully in the next year or so, we have an extremely ambitious fellowship uh, program that we plan on uh, bringing online that will take uh, about a, a dozen or so journalists from across the country and for over a year's time, uh, do intensive training with those journalists with the eyes towards them producing an investigative project in their home community where they work. And so we're really excited about that opportunity. It'll do a couple of things. One, it'll introduce uh, uh, the country to, to some really smart uh, journalists of color throughout the country. Uh, that sometimes when they're working hard in their home communities, you know, the, the rest of the nation may not see all the, the great work they're doing. And so it'll do that. But then also it'll, it'll start to break down those barriers where editors uh, that are looking for this talent begin to say, oh, we can't find these people and we don't know where they are. Well, we, we tend to obliterate that um, and using this program will, will help us do that. Right. Okay. Yeah, if I, if I could add, so we are only four years old um, and we've grown a lot. And uh, as COVID has taken over the country, we've moved our trainings online. So we have, uh, we've done a couple virtual training series. We have two virtual training series launching. Um, but what's really important to us is we just, um, why, why we founded this organization is because investigative reporting is the most important reporting in our democracy, right? It, it is that type of reporting that holds power accountable, that exposes the way that powerful people wield that power in ways that are harmful uh, to individuals and communities. And yet uh, that is also the widest aspect of our profession. And so we know that there are just simply stories that are not being covered and communities that are not getting the type of spotlight that they need. And that's really critical to our mission is to continue to expand, uh, focus on covering racial inequality, racial injustice, marginalized communities, but really changing that complexion. Um, there's a lot of journalist organizations, but we have not seen the needle moving. And so we're very thoughtful about what we invest in and the type of work that we invest in because we actually want to help create more uh, black investigative reporters and investigative reporters of color in general. So um, we, we're just continuing to expand that work and getting people the training that they need to do that. Okay, wonderful. One of the things that I didn't point out earlier on, which I just wanna take a moment uh, to do now, and that was uh, that the, the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting was honored with the, the Donna Allen Award for Feminist Advocacy just this past summer, I think. And that yeah. award was given by the Commission on the Status of Women within the Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Communication, particularly because of the, the efforts of the society to identify, mentor, and retain journalists of color. So I wanted to make sure that folks know that that again uh your work is being acknowledged and and 
I know you said it's only four years. We got great expectations. <laughs> We're going to keep coming back. I also want to acknowledge that a good number of people really want uh, want the panelists to talk a little bit about Ida B. Wells' uh, backstory, her, her life, whatever. And I'd like to come back to that if it's okay. I'll get um, through this main part of the questioning. We'll get through some of the nuts and bolts, and then we'll go back and make sure that we cover that. But now let's get to the to the 1619 uh, project. And, and, and I wanted to, to go back and, and ask a little bit uh, about uh, what's happened since then. We know that uh, uh, you can always tell when you're, you're, you're about to get to some success when particular people start criticizing the project uh, in, in a national frame. So uh, uh, a number of folks have already asked us, what do you, how do you respond uh, to some of the, the hysteria that's, uh, that's resulted from the success of the project. I imagine if it hadn't been successful, nothing would have been said. But the fact that it has legs, as we say, um, has, has drawn some criticism. How do you respond to that? What, what ways do you uh, uh, help people understand, number one, why that happens, that it's not new, and that there are ways to, to, to answer it? Yeah, I mean, how I just respond depends on the day, uh, but <laughs> mostly these days I'm trying to respond by not going on Twitter. Um, you know, so one, I, I, I clearly expected that there was going to be pushback to the project. The reason the project uh, had to exist in the first place is we have not as a society wanted to deal with the legacy of slavery. We have... Um, wanted to treat slavery as an asterisk to the American story and not as foundational to the American story. And we were making evocative arguments about the centrality of slavery. So of course, um, I, I have a, a degree in history. I've studied history a long time. And I know how uh, so much of the, the history that we are taught um, is a history that is part of the nationalistic endeavor that wants us to downplay the role of things that we find contrary to how we want to see our country and play up uh, the things that we think glorify our country. So I, I clearly knew there was going to be pushback. I did not, uh, of course, predict that more than a year after the project came out, it would become part of um, a presidential campaign, a white nationalist presidential campaign, I would say. Um, so. I don't really respond to that at all. I, I don't think there's a need to respond. Uh, we've had to respond to certain criticism of the project that's come from um, a small group of historians. I think that's worthy uh, to respond to that type of critique. I don't think it, it's worthy to respond to a bluster coming from the White House where uh, he really, I, I think in some ways they're, they're trying to bait us into responding. So to me, um, we know that the, there's a congressional law that prevents the federal government from uh, telling local school districts how to teach and what to teach. There's no enforcement mechanism for what he's proposing. And uh, the 1619 Project as adopted in schools, which is really what uh, the president says he's concerned about, um, it's supplementary to the really poor way we're already taught history. So uh, it would be amazing if there was this much concern about the fact that only 15% of American high school students even know the Civil War was taught or fought over slavery. They don't. Um, so we know that this isn't really about a fear that our children are not learning proper history. There, there, there's been no concern about the way our children have been learning uh, improper history before, but largely I'm trying these days not to respond at all. I think the work I mean, this is all of us with what we do. Our work has to speak for itself. But, but you know, if I could just please, that, that, right I mean, right. Nicole can take care of herself and um, and speak for herself. But I would just you know add to that the if, if you look at the criticism, um, the thing that 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 stands out is is um, that it's almost as if. The, the people who are criticizing it act as though slavery itself didn't exist. I mean, as if this was some some fantasy that just that just was dreamed up. And you know, I was always taught that the truth speaks for itself. That there was slavery. I mean, we know this. That is a fact. There is there's no way to gloss over that and to say that well, you know, the founders put the country on the track to end 
slavery, well, you know, that was nice for the, the, the people who had to endure for 100 years while we were on track to end, end that practice of, of slavery. So, you know, the arguments are, are ridiculous and that the truth, again, speaks for itself. These things happen and you don't hide greatness by deflection. Greatness owns up to its mistakes. Greatness owns up to the, the, all the warts that, that, are, that are there. And, and you try to get better. That's what greatness is. Greatness is not pretending that something didn't happen. Topher, were you going to say uh, something? Like, no, I mean, uh, the, I mean, it's been well said. I just uh, none of you didn't see these people out uh, on their Twitter pages when there were all these uh, happy depictions of slavery, slaves in these uh, history books throughout, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, and Texas, and uh, and how they just gloss over uh, the atrocities of slavery to kind of depict it as this period of, you know, amiable togetherness between. Uh, the workers of the of the plantation and those that they worked alongside. Uh, look at how happy they are in these illustrations. So they can miss me with all of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, like, you know, we didn't create this history. It's I, I have I, I I've got like a stack of books right now that I'm going through uh, so I can answer all the criticism. Um, <laughs> right, like. So it, this, this notion of being shocked as if this history has not been well laid out for decades, um, we simply popularized it for a mass um, audience, which is what journalism does best. And I have to say, I've taken a, a great deal of uh, strength from Ida B. Wells. My own newspaper called Ida B. Wells a slanderous and nasty mulatress for daring to pretend that Black men were victims of lynchings, right? So, so this idea that like, Black women that want to expose uh, the truth about our country will be attacked, uh, that just puts me in, in a great legacy and tradition, and I, and I take great, great heart from that. Um, as you said, if, if people were not uh, concerned with the power of what we were, we were able to do with the project, no one would still you know, be writing against the project every day a year later. One can only hope to produce journalism that stirs people up in that way. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've always wondered if any time that American, this idea of American exceptionalism is, is challenged, if there's the, the kind of, the, whether it's journalism or historical studies, the kind of work that Professor Lowry does, uh, if that narrative is upset, uh, that it seems that, that some folks, I, I think they don't agree with Ron, uh, that you know, the honesty and integrity of what you do should speak for itself. They don't, right? The 1776 yeah, go ahead, please. Of patriotic education is not saying let the history speak for itself. It's saying let's teach a history that makes us feel patriotic. And of course, Black people are very inconvenient to this notion because we're like, oh yeah, 1776, none of that apply to us. Um, so we're expected to be silenced, but it, these aren't people who are seeking truth. These are people who are seeking indoctrination. And those, those two things are, are surely not the same. Right, right. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually move on. You know, this is actually the, and you've probably done enough of these already, Nicole, that this could be an entire, uh, an entire Saturday morning and, and afternoon looking at that that, that kind of structure. And for an older person like myself who still has elementary school books that, <laughs> that tells us that slaves, uh, enslaved people at the end of the war were saying, master, what is freedom? You know, yeah. and that was, yeah, that was actually taught to us. So uh, w when I hear it today and you tell me that it's still not being taught uh, right. in the appropriate way, uh, it, 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 it gives you pause, but it also explains a lot of what we're seeing in other places when it comes to supremacist uh, notions and ideas. Well, I want to look, I want to go, I, I want to go further, I guess, now and, and jump to this other place. And this is that place where you could say a little bit about uh, what you see, uh, not only in terms of your own work, your, your individual work and your individual workplaces, the work of the Ida B. Wells Society, and, and trying to encourage uh, young people uh, to, to get involved in, in journalism, particularly investigative journalism, yeah. and, and what do you see as the barriers? What do you see going forward? Obviously, the society addresses one of those barriers, 
but what do you see now as kind of the primary reasons that uh, we don't see more uh, investigative journalists in all areas of, of, of journalism? Well, I, I think there, there are several issues there. We're trying to address all of them, actually. Uh, right. the, the main thing is <clears throat> something that Topher alluded to earlier is that um, people don't see us in that way. When we come into journalism, there are a few areas that we are steered into. And investigative journalism, for the most part, is not one of them. Um, so even if you're in the newsroom, people will tell you, well, you don't have enough experience or, well, you need, to, you need I don't see any work from you that, that gives me reason to think that you could do this. But at the same time, you don't give me an opportunity to, to do it. So, and then there's a, the, the training aspect, which is, which is true, which is something that we're trying to, to take, a, take away all of those excuses by one, providing the training for people, uh, two, talking to, to newsrooms about uh, the people of color that are in those newsrooms and giving them the opportunity to do it. Because we're not just trying to, to bring in you know, investigative reporters, but also editors like myself uh, there's a young woman who I met at one of our trainings um, a few years ago who we provided the training to her because they would not give her the opportunity to do this in their newsroom. But what really changed the dynamics for her was that she got an editor, uh, a black editor who gave her the opportunity to do that. So we not only need to change and, and train black reporters, but also editors and, and get people into those positions like myself that I can hire and fire people, you know? And if, if you can do that, then you can control the dynamics of what happens in that, in that newsroom. The other thing is to raise the profile, as Topher mentioned, of young journalists of color who are out there doing work, right? You know, uh, there's plenty of, of uh, okay, there's not plenty of Nicole's, but there's some other Nicole's out there that can, that can that do the work. There are other Tophers that, that, can, get, that, can, that can do the work. And, you know, and, and sometimes those people are, are, are steered into other areas. And if I, if I, without embarrassing Topher, when I first met Topher, Topher wanted to be a novelist. Uh, and so glad he didn't. Glad that he was able to to he come. He still in. does. I'm still working on that. He still does. You know, taking that shot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what you mean? What you mean? Used to. He still you, does. <laughs> I've probably added the investigative reporting aspect of this too, because look at some of the things that wouldn't have been done had he not entered. You know, the walking while while black, or just some of the other things that that he did. Got a video of of. Of a, of, of a black man being mistreated um, that the police tried to, to, to conceal for, for years, I believe. So all of those things would not have been done had he not become an investigative reporter. And so those are all the things that we're trying to do. And as I said at the outset, we're literally trying to change the face of journalism. We don't want unicorns. We don't want, it's, it's too late in the game in the 21st century to be talking about the first black something. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and if I just add to that, you know, one of the other the roadblocks is out there is not just the the idea of the opportunities. It, it, you know, there occasionally where they'll sneak us in for opportunity, but is then it's even just diminishing of our work. So yeah. when we want to now put the investigative title and allow us to be able to take, I mean, how long the sixteen nineteen project take to develop, right? If you want us to take the six, eight, nine, ten months to develop something that's going to have standing power, have impact, give us those opportunities too. But they'll often look at us and say, you know, I just don't see it. I just don't, even when we've completed the work, even when we've shown them we're capable of the work. So that's where finding, you know, all the Ron Nixons that we can find to be editors in these positions is so vitally important because he's right. They're the gatekeepers to really empowering in Nicole Hannah-Jones or Topher Sanders to do the kind of work that we're capable of doing. And so there's just, there's so much to be done in IW Wells Society for Investigative Reporting. We're tackling it all. 
Yeah. I, I quickly, I mean, the difference between uh, the Nicole or the uh, Topher who was not an investigative reporter and the Nicole and Topher who was, was somebody letting us actually do it, right? Like we had built up through reporting the ability to do these things. Oftentimes black journalists have to fight and sneak <laughs> to right back end our way into investigative reporting and into uh, doing project work and until we actually get the, the chance and support. So it's not like overnight someone flips a switch and once, you know, a white editor realizes we can do it, then we can do it. We, we have always the potential and ability to do that. So what we're trying to do with the project is, or excuse me, with the society is one, demystify what investigative reporting is. It's just good reporting. Um, we all can do that. We don't have to have a title to do it. So we try to demystify. We try to uh, give people the benefit of our knowledge from what it took for us obstacles, how we overcame those obstacles. And above all, journalism is a trade. We have professionalized it with degrees, but it is a trade. And there are certain skills that if you get them and you master them, you become undeniable. And I think that's what our work is really trying to do is make people undeniable. And I, and I do got to have to shout out Ron. Uh, Ron is the highest ranking uh, Black investigative journalist in the country, maybe the world. Um, and that position does give him a power not just to shape coverage, but uh, not to ignore the next Topher who can't ever get a chance to even get their foot in the door of doing investigative reporting. Um, and, and that is critical. So we, we do want to increase reporters, but we also have to increase uh, ourselves in the ranks of power. And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna extend that if I can. I mean, thank you, thank you all. I mean, this that was really illuminating. I mean, when I when I think about as a person who's taught, and when I have students to say I'm interested in this and I'm interested in that, and what can I do? I don't want to do this kind of thing. I, I, I can, I, you know, I have to confess, that I'm not I'm not pushing them towards journalism. I haven't, uh, and and um, some of them have become very very prominent journalists. But it's because they were very, very extraordinary uh, individuals themselves. But um, I mean, just the, the possibilities. And, and when I look at uh, all of the work that you all have done, and I just think, well, you know, that's one of the things that I read when I was trying to understand this issue. This is one of those pieces that was very important for me understanding that this actually was an issue. So in a lot of ways, it touches us. And, and it, it may be, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of uh, salute to the skill that you, you employ and you deploy when doing your work, that it hasn't been something that jumped up that way. But I think in, in, in some cases, it misses us, the importance of the kind of work that you all are doing. I, I do want to press one more piece on this, and then we're going to go back to Melinda. Uh, and this is a question that uh, someone placed to us, and uh, it, it sort of touches on what you've just spoken about. But it focuses on the challenges that faces, uh, that faces uh, black female reporters uh, and black female journalists uh, as they move from beat reporting to investigative uh, journalism. Are there, what are the, I'm not even gonna ask, are there, what are the special challenges, if you will? Of being a black woman? No, don't, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have? Uh, uh, but what's the question of being? It's 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 uh, in this in this realm that we've just spoken about. Uh, you know that that area where you and Topher and Ron uh, occupy a particular space now. That uh, the feeling is is that for uh, black women pursuing what you want, what you've just been speaking about, uh, it's different. It's, it's not the yeah. same kind of thing, yeah. I mean, it's the same dynamics um, at work as when you, with your opening question, is we, uh, uh, investigative reporting is a very white field. It's also a very male field. So to be black um, already makes it difficult. And then to be a black woman makes it doubly as challenging because uh, not that many women, we're seeing more, mostly white women, we're seeing more women now uh, getting the opportunities to do the field of investigative reporting, but not that many. And we could probably list, you know, on two hands, a number of black women investigative reporters. We know we might not even need that second hand. Um, 
if you talk about black women who have that actual title. So it, it's the intersection of those inequalities and how we're seeing. One of the things I was thinking about when Ron and, and um, Topher were talking is it's even like there's certain jobs that lead to investigative reporting jobs. Mm-hmm. We often don't get those jobs. So we are, you know, put in, we, we get a school's uh, education um, beat job, which of course can be investigative, but that is not typically the pipeline to become investigative reporting. Those jobs tend to be the people who get to cover the city government or the state house, right? We are seldom as black women, even uh, given the opportunity to do those types of jobs, which means we are often excluded from the pipeline in general and put into beats that are less valued by the power structures of the organization that are considered women's beats. Uh, Education is considered in many ways, people don't say this, but just look at who education writers are, the women's beat. So it it is facing um, those types of uh, double inequality. And it's also what we want to cover, right? Like, the, the types of issues that black women often want to cover, not exclusively, I've written about everything, but, but what drives us into journalism are not valued by people who run investigative desks. Um, I had to prove that racial inequality can be an investigative beat because that was not considered an investigative beat. And I think that is, that's the challenge that, that we still face. There, there are, uh, it is rare to see, that's one of the reasons we named our organization after Ida B. Wells, we had to go back to slavery to find, <laughs> to find a good example, which is not true. There certainly are uh, black women investigative reporters, but who have the actual title of investigative reporter, not just people who are doing investigations as part of their, you know, on their beat, but have the title, very rare. Right. So uh, let's do this. This has been a fascinating. Uh, I can tell the 226 people that are listening, I would love to turn off all of your videos and just keep these folks here with me for the rest of the morning. <laughs> but of course, I would get in trouble for doing that. So uh, if Dr. Lowry will come back on screen with me, I know uh, there was one set of questions that you've already been looking at, uh, particularly about, so, so let me Uh, If you will, I'm going to scan some of the questions while you're talking with the panelists, and then I'll come back in as well. Sure. Um, Thank you again, everyone, for really just a starter of great insights. Um, Some folks have been asking great questions about Ida B. Wells' own experience and history. I want to point people to some of the other um, events in our series because we're going to have a variety of really creative ways to engage her story um, throughout the month. So south.unc.edu is where people can sign up, register for some of those events. But in particular, I wonder if um, uh, Nicole, Topher, and Ron, if you might think about particular defining, what you have found to be the defining moments in Ida's life that have mirrored your journeys mm-hmm. in particular ways. There might be you know, strong overlaps, or you might say, no, she had a completely different context, and here's how I've been able to leverage my knowledge of her context. Mm-hmm. Is there some things like that you could comment on just to give people, you know, give them another point of curiosity, another way to get curious? Um, I think for me, there are two things. One, we're from the same state, both from oh. poor rural areas in, in Mississippi. Um, but the, I guess I happened to stumble across a, a documentary on PBS, I don't know, when I was, it was years and years and years ago, and I can't even remember this, but uh, I knew about Ida B. Wells, and, but I didn't know the depth of her work. And when they were talking about it, uh, it was the first time that sort of data journalism made sense to me. It's like, well, wait a minute, this sister was doing this before there was even a computer. You know, I don't even know what she was using in Abacus or something, but you know, it was- <laughs> He was the computer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But, you know, it, it stuck because it's like her work was systemic. You know, she was looking at the, the system of, of, of white racism and not just individual cases where it could easily be blown off to say, well, you know, in that case, this is what happened. But to be able to show that, no, this is, this is throughout society. This is not just an individual incident here. But she also taught me to go beyond the numbers. While she did collect all of this, this data, her ultimate conclusion was like in lynching, the, 
the official uh, uh, reason was that, oh, that, you know, a black man raped a, a white woman. It's just like, nah, these, these relationships in many cases were consensual. And the white woman started screaming rape after they got caught. And so this is why her, 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 uh, her paper was burned and she was run out of, of Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee. But, the, um, but I think that knowing that a, a black woman was doing this years before some of the people that we are taught in school, like the Ida Tarbos and this, the, the Lincoln Steffen and the great muckrakers, uh, that she was never mentioned in the same breath as, as those people, right? And so- well, Upton Sinclair, like Ida B. Sinclair, is so much right? yeah. Upton Sinclair, and, and right. I never read any Wells in college. Right. And even uh -huh. if you read some of the stuff from Upton Sinclair and folks like that, it's pretty racist on what they thought about black people. And so you're like, how can these people be like my heroes right. when they don't even think that I'm that I'm like human? I mean, if you read the jungle and read what he talked about the, the ignorant Negroes in the, in the in the jungle, but the fact that there was this black woman doing this kind of work before there was even a term called investigative reporter reporter was just uh, fascinating for me and, and started me on this journey. And I'll jump in there before uh, Nicole, uh, who is Ida Bay Wells, uh, <laughs> finishes up. Uh, uh, for me, it's really I'm just echoing what Ron said. Um, it was I, I, my connect uh, with with Ida B. Wells is the idea of breaking through what at the time was the government narrative, which is often the white narrative, and using the data information to break through that narrative and to expose the truth. That's and I do that in all of my work. Essentially, I do a ton of criminal justice work. So I'm, I spend all day attempting to do what Ida did. And so uh, that is uh, my profound connection to her work and it kind of it inspires me all the time. Um, that was all great. I, I think, you know, for me, clearly as, as a black woman, my connection to her uh, is both like this professional and spiritual in that um, she was not a, a woman who was going to be contained to what the world thought the place of a woman should be, and certainly not a black woman. You know, we, we think about Rosa Parks, I Ida B. Wells challenged segregation on public transit nearly 100 years before Rosa Parks um, fought back when, they, when she bought a first class ticket and they tried to make her go to the color car. And that actually went all the way to the state Supreme Court unfortunately was then used in Plessy v. Ferguson by the Supreme Court because she lost the case. But like this idea um, that she always knew her full humanity, whether the world recognized it or not, whether men recognized it, whether white people recognized it. Um, and I remember when I first read her autobiography and saw that like she found a man who was as feminist as she was. She hyphenated her last name. You know, most women when they get married today do not keep their last name, right? But she was like, I'm going to keep my last name, uh, took her child out reporting with her when she had babies. She didn't just stay at home and, and give up her job. And so to see that there was a model of the type of woman I wanted to be uh, who existed uh, during the period of reconstruction and right after, I was just uh, tremendously affirming of um, who Black women have always been, uh, but who did not resemble what we have taught, been taught that Black women always are. So there's there's everything about her I, I have found inspirational um, and really try to, I, I really do like, I you know, Ida Bay Wales is my Twitter handle. I, she is really a guiding light for me. She she just refused to stay in her place. And I think that um, I try not to stay in my place either. Uh, so there's, there's yeah, she's, she's amazing. And it was the most, um, stunningly profound moment when Ida B. Wells got her Pulitzer on the same day that I got mine because I know for a fact I would not exist uh, as a journalist doing the work that I did in the place that I do it uh, without Ida B. Wells uh, paving the way and, and as a model. So uh, I, I'm agnostic. I don't really believe in uh, you know all of that, but it did seem like there was some divine intervention on that day. <laughs> right, right. You know, I can remember uh, doing so, some work on uh, lynching in Atlanta. And as I read about her life, I think what sometimes I, it's, it's not fully clear that what she was doing was exceptionally and extremely dangerous. Yes. That they absolutely. were, they, she, I mean, was, they absolutely had 
an, an underground and above ground uh, hit out on her. She would still sneak into these places, get on a train, you know, unobtrusively go in, do her work, and then come back and a black man was, was lynched yesterday. She, I mean, it, she would put it out. Yes. So there's a, there's a level, uh, there's a heroic uh, uh, piece about her, um, but there's also a very strong ethical core that runs through her work. And uh, uh, to, to wish that a lot of that was here today. Um, there is a, a piece uh, that Melinda has put over in the chat, and I think we need to pay attention to that because uh, neither, of, neither of us can forget where we are working uh, at the current moment. Melinda, why don't you ask that question? And I'll stay out of trouble. Why don't you ask the question? <laughs> The work of, of, of Black women always got to do it. Yeah. See that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know where my leaders are. You know, I, just, I, take, I take my delegation from Dr. Jordan all right. at all times. Right. <laughs> um, so, Danita Mason Hogan is a member of our Orange County Community Remembrance Coalition that has inspired and and led us on this on this event. Has asked, what part do you think UNC and other public universities should play with addressing these historic institutional injustices and the harm that uh, they have caused to local communities when they add white supremacist narratives to public education, um, when they contribute to inequities in their local school systems. For example, Chapel Hill has the second largest achievement gap in the country. And that doesn't seem to be co coincidental there's a relationship between UNC as an institution and that achievement gap. And I wonder if y'all have some insights about that in, in terms of how investigative journalism especially can, can reveal patterns, but also can make change as people are seeking to do so. No, neither of y'all wanna take that? Take it, UNC alum, take it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, circles back. <laughs> you guys have just heard Nicole call us out before that it's always the black woman that has to answer the question. <laughs> we, we go again. Well, well, you know, I, yeah. I'll continue to play the role that we always play. Um, I, one, I mean, I've been very vocal about this. I think public universities, universities in general, play a tremendous role um, in both uh, creating the inequality, sustaining the inequality. And I think that they also are often the most, one of the most powerful institutions in the communities they serve. They have, they employ uh, the largest number of people and they wield a tremendous amount of power around how the rest of uh, the town, especially in a college town like Chapel Hill operate. Um, and yet they've largely, you know, thrown their hands up on using that influence uh, to bring about more equality, which is not surprising because they also uh, tend to have uh, operate with a lot of inequality on the campuses. So a place like UNC, which um, literally is a university founded by enslavers, um, many buildings uh, dedicated to enslavers, uh, enslaved people uh, lived and worked on the campus, and yet we as far as we seem to ever want to go is to study the issue and uh it is time for more than study there's time for restitution um i've advocated i think that universities like the university of north carolina should actually implement scholarships for descendants of american slavery uh particularly uh those descendants should be able to attend universities either at a very deep discount or free. I think that you have to be serious that restitution has to come in more than just, uh, you know, thinking and contemplating what was done, but actually trying to address the harm. Uh, I don't think that you should be expecting students to go into buildings named after people who um, operated forced labor slave camps. Um, so I think, yeah, clearly this is a university that is willing to pay a lot of money to preserve monuments to white supremacists and slavers. Uh, it would be good to see that same effort being put towards addressing the harms of those white supremacists and slavers. Is that good enough? Is that, is that the answer y'all were looking for? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. I'm 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 happy. Uh, let me let me ask you another question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm good. I'm good. Uh, as, as I sit here on campus today looking out the window. But this is, you know, this was, a, a, I think, a very complete response. And I think that a lot of, as you know, a lot of that conversation 
uh, is going on in, in various quarters here. So, um, and actually, Dr. Jordan, I'm sorry to not, not please, please. now. We don't even have to go back to slavery at University of North Carolina, right? So we know when the first black person was admitted to the university, yeah. that black people's tax dollars also funded, to be clear. Um, and so when I think about when every time I come to Carolina, I stay at the Carolina Inn. And the Carolina Inn, I think the photos on the wall, they stopped putting photos of alum on the wall after 19, I think it's the same year that black people, shortly after black people were admitted, 1960. Yeah. 768. And so every photo on that wall, uh, except for maybe four, uh, are of white people because black people were not allowed to attend uh, the first public university in this country, founded in the 1700s until what, 1965, 1966, because of federal court order. So we have a, a living legacy. There are black people in Chapel Hill right now. Who, could, who were denied entry, who were not able to attend a university that was their state university, that their parents and they pay tax uh, dollars for, you can find living victims to pay restitution to if you want to. This is not an ancient legacy and, and we need to be clear about that ongoing legacy um, with living victims right now. Exactly, thank you. I always say I'm gonna go over there and just put my picture on the wall even though all the pictures <laughs> are black and white. <laughs> You're gonna mess up and start a movement and mess or on Monday, you have a whole, a whole line of people with their own little portraits placed them on the Exactly. Wall. Just, not I'm, I'm not advocating up. taking the pictures down, but yeah. Yeah. if somebody did an art project, I wouldn't. Uh, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Let me, let me go uh, back there. Uh, uh, you know, uh, when Nicole says she takes her uh, inspiration from Ida B. Wells, you can see it. <laughs> you can see it. <laughs> you know. But but let's ask. This is a this was something that I think was was uh, was very very serious for for one of the audience members, and that has been her own experience. And she notes that in her 15 years of daily and breaking news, she has never been encouraged to do investigative journalism, and she wants to know how she can help, or the best way to help her newsroom teach more people to take that route. Well, actually, she probably needs to teach them to take that route. But in any case, how do you become an activist in your own workspace uh, in order to, to, to move uh, whatever your organization is towards allowing more of this to happen? Um, well, so I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I think right now, you know, just like there's a reckoning around uh, race and inequality in the country right now, there's also the same thing happening in the newsrooms around the country um, that, you know, people of color in those newsrooms are demanding, you know, not asking, but demanding that, you know, they be given the same opportunities that their white colleagues have. And I think it, that is a moment to take advantage of the fact that there are no, you know, I, I, I don't know the particular newsrooms, so just in general here but that there are no people of color in these positions. And, and so making that argument to the editors, to your publishers, to the, the Metro editor, to the, you know, that, that these are the things that we're wanting to do as well and, and succeed or fail. I mean, we just want to be given the opportunity to, to do so because not everybody pans out. And that means that white journalists too, not all of them are successful in doing this. We're just asking an opportunity to, to be able to do this. The other thing is, is you know, if, if the person wants to contact us, I mean, we can certainly operate with training to help uh, the journalists and the newsroom uh, to provide training for people of color and, and everybody in that, that newsroom who want to do this, this type of work. And then I think having a conversation with that, that newsroom around the whole issue of of, of getting journalists of color into positions of giving them the opportunities to do this and hiring people that can do this work too. Because what we're often told is, is that, well, they can't find anybody. Well, you know, I find that hard to believe because we know of tons of people who can do this, this work and they're, they're not hired. You know, they're giving either fellowships or they're giving something that, you know, a trial and then they're not kept on permanently. And, and, and lastly, just to add that, you know, we keep hearing about people can't finding folks. And, and I don't know what that means because if you go to a journalism school, 
right? And you ask people how they recruit. I, I mean, I've just asked point blank this. How do you hire white people? And they tell me the process. And I'm saying, well, why can't that work for people of color? If you go to Mizzou, if you go to UNC, if you go to Northwestern, you go to all the big journalism schools, right? There are journalists of color there. What, are they invisible the day that you're there? I mean, why can't you find people there? If you're hiring white journalists from those schools, why can't you, you find black journalists, black and brown journalists from those schools? And then there's schools like Howard University, FAMU, Tuskegee, Alabama State University, on and on, the HBCUs. I mean, is there some barrier that prevents you from going there to recruit people? So it's the people need to stop making excuses as to why they can't find people. Because again, we don't have a diversity problem in the newsroom. We have a lack of hiring black and brown people in the newsroom. Yeah. Look, you can't uh, control, go ahead, go ahead. Tofu. Yeah, I was gonna, uh, yeah, you, you know, uh, one thing I'll just say is that, uh, um, that none of the people you see here on this panel were ever encouraged to do this work. Exactly. Um, and so uh, that's that's just one thing. And I, I know that's a, it's not not easy to, to say or hear or whatever, but, you know, in fact, uh, if, in, I know for me and Nicole, specifically Ron too, to, we were discouraged <laughs> to do this work. We were told we weren't supposed to do this work, couldn't do this work. Yep. And you have to really want it and fight against those and I think for me in my, my walk, the best fight was finding the stories that just could not be rejected, Yeah. right? And that was, that was my activism. That was what I did in my newsroom because it, I know at least where I was, I was like one of two. And, and just like Nicole said, the other person was on the education beat, right? And so I wasn't gonna mount an insurrection in my <laughs> newsroom to make them make us investigative reporters. It yeah. wasn't gonna happen. So I had to go and find the stories, find the stories, work the stories. And Nicole wasn't lying when she said sneak. Yeah. Like I'd have to work on a story three, four, five weeks on my own time, develop it, bring basically a completely baked cake short of the icing on it to the editors and for them to go, huh, hmm, all right, go for it. You got what you mean, what, two more days? You know, like <laughs> whatever yeah. it was. Yeah. And that's what I had to do in order to do this work. And, and so that's one of those, those are the motivating factors for why we created IDA. We'd like to create an environment and an, a, a, an apparatus, an organization that helps to mitigate a lot of that for a yes. lot of people, right? And so, but, but all that to say is definitely, whoever that person is, reach, reach out to us and we could have a conversation with you offline or whatever. But I will just say that part of the, the beginning process will be for you to find the stories that are that are going to work the stories that are going to push it over the edge and even then they push back on you and they tell you you can't yep. but that's where you can talk to us and we can help you yeah that i mean you basically said what i was going to say we 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 at the society are all about controlling what you can control you cannot control the way editors will see you you cannot control the way that your uh, newsrooms function you should certainly fight and advocate for them to be more um equal, but you can't control that, but you can control what you do. And not none of us were investigative reporters. We all were beat reporters and we had to find ways to do investigations on our beat. And we actually teach in our trainings, a session on how to do investigative reporting on your beat, understanding that most of us are not going to be in a position to take off a month uh, even two weeks to investigate a story. So you have to invest in yourself. When I decided I want to do this type of reporting and I was watching them send the white reporters to IRE every year and not me when I would raise my hand. They're like, no, we really want to send someone who's already doing this work. Well, how the hell do I do the work if you don't give me the, you know, the chance or training to do the work. So I wrote to IRE and was like, I want to come. My newsroom won't send me. Do you have a fellowship? They didn't have one, but they made one for me. Right. So that is the sort of thing that you're going to have to do. And it's unfair. But the reason our motto is be twice as good is because we already know um, as journalists of color as marginalized groups, we do have to work harder to get the same things. And our society is not about the world. We're about building the world that we want to have, but we're not, we're not in that world yet. So we have to work around the world that we currently have. So please sign, if you're not a member, sign up. Um, our trainings are free or low cost for a reason. We try to get rid of all of the obstacles uh, and we will give you the skills, but you're going to have to find a way to 
do that work. And that's how you become undeniable. Topher did enough of that. I did enough of that. Ron did enough of that where it was impossible for them to deny us the ability to do a bigger project at some point. Um, Linda, do you want to, uh, I think we're getting, you know, close to the, the moment that we're in. So <clears throat> Linda, if you want to put, there's some absolutely marvelous yeah. questions in the queue. Uh, why don't you uh, do this last round or this last uh, okay. question, and then I'll uh, get ready to talk about the next event. Sure, I can, we could just go on and on. So apologies to all of you that have typed fine questions. We're kind of trying to address a few of them at one time. Um, one of the sort of most salient comments we've gotten is, you know, ordinary citizens, right? We've heard a lot since our uprisings to about doing the work. You know, we've heard a lot about don't lean on your black friend. Um, <laughs> don't ask someone to explain this to you. And yet uh, folks who want to be allies are, are struggling you know, might be with their paradigm, might be with the information that they have access to or their community, you know, but they're struggling to figure out how to work with the, this knowledge in their everyday lives. And I think that goes to K-12 teachers. So we've had a great set of questions about what do you think teachers can do in their classrooms to begin that younger generation and bring them up in this approach, this knowledge, but then also from from citizens who would like to know ways to engage respectfully and properly um, to support the right kind of journalism. We've also had questions about journalists being, a, news organizations being accountable, some of the things that you spoke to. But how can, so how can citizens um, advocate for better investigative reporting for more uh, coverage by black and brown journalists of it's critical issues to our society. Um, how can citizens employ this knowledge in their everyday lives? And especially how can K-12 teachers bring this work to their classrooms? That was a lot. That was, that was a lot. I'm, sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm, an, I'm, a pre, I'm a professor, so I can't help. <laughs> Okay, which one Let's start with K-12 teachers. I'll, how about okay. that? I, I don't have much for the K-12 teachers. <laughs> I do have something on the on the on the uh, on how to encourage, you know, it, you know, the news news development, print journalism, local journalism. Can I start there? Can I go yes. ahead and jump in there? All right. So you know, one I, I think that this has came out in, in a number of the talks we, we've been doing as a society, is that you I think you just you one, you have to participate in your local coverage. You have to read your newspaper. You have to take in your, your local news station. And then when you see the coverage that matters to you, that you like, you need to tell those organizations and those entities that this coverage matters to me. I enjoyed this segment that so-and-so did. This article written by Blank was outstanding because, and I want to see more of it. You got to tell them that. If you're just kind of sitting around waiting for your local newspaper to deliver the, the news you just really love to you, it probably isn't going to happen. And so you need to advocate for the work you want to see, and you need to celebrate the bylines and those on local news stations that are doing the work that you find to be uh, important to the community. So I think, I think that's, that's the, for me, the biggest because the organization is going to respond to what readership tells them they want and what the dollars seem to follow. So you have to show that that matters to you. Another piece to it? Personal responsibility. Okay. That sums it up. You know. that, 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 that part of personal responsibility, that it has to be an active citizenship. It can't be a kind of a, a laid back uh, citizenry that that expects to, to receive what they want to receive. Because that's, you know, we know that white institutions just have a history of, you know, delivering what we want when we want it, right? So yeah, <laughs> if you just right. back and wait, then sure, that's, you know, you're gonna get what you want. Well, the US News and World Report just dismissed an, a letter from black law students at UNC arguing for how their ranking system excludes, ignores metrics of diversity that you know, then law schools get to exclude and ignore when they're doing admissions and curriculum and everything else. 
and the U.S. News and World Report just dismissed them, you know, which is ironic, of course, for an organization that prides itself on its coverage. Um, so one step, right, is for the people who object to that coverage to write in and demand yeah. something, you know, different. Yeah, I mean, we could look at who makes the editorial decisions at U.S. News and World Report and predict uh, who made those decisions because you know, they have their objective standards and objectively they don't think that's important. So that is a big part of it. Um, and I'm just gonna quickly, I, I get this question all the time in my talks about like, how can white people be good allies? Um, I, I would try to treat this question respectfully, but my answer is always, no one consulted us on how to create all of this inequality and racism and segregation. So this kind of faux helplessness about how to undo it, I actually find it very perturbing. Like, uh, y'all can figure out anything that you want to figure out. There are tons of research, books, information, and we were not asked our opinion on how to create it. So, uh, you know, don't, don't expect that we now have to supply you with the answers, which by the way, when we give the answers, folks are always like, well, yeah, but I, I can't really do that. So uh, I'm not giving no answers because... I don't think the question, I think the question is coming from a good place, but um, not coming from a practical place. Thank you. All right. Well, we're, we're actually getting to that time. You know, I'm going to do this. I mean, sometimes people do it, sometimes they don't. Is there anything that you all want to say in closing before we uh, thank the, the audience who stuck with us? If you look here, they have stuck with us throughout the entire program. So uh, that engagement I think has a great deal to do with uh, the way you've been responding for us honestly uh, and directly and actually uh, putting information in people's uh, pockets that's usable. So as we, as we close out, I just want to go around if there's anything you want to say, uh, anything you want to leave us with uh, before we go off to the rest of the day. Donate to the Ida B. Wells Society. That's that is the, yes. <laughs> Become a member of the Ida B. Wells Society and participate. Okay. And donate. And donate, okay. <laughs> Topher, if you don't say donate. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, oh, okay. Donate to the Ida B. Wells Society. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, well, once again, uh, uh, I want to thank the Orange County Community Remembrance Coalition Center for the Study of the American South, Center for the Study of the American South, Carolina Public Humanities. I have to say, this is probably one of the best organized and most informative programs that I've been a part of for the past four or five years. And I'm, I'm really happy that, uh, that the Orange County uh, Community Remembrance Coalition has prodded the university to do something that it should have been doing a long time ago. Thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, to Nicole, Topher, Ron, once again, thank you for joining us, taking times out of your busy day, sharing your experiences and your insights. Uh, Dr. Lowry, thanks for, uh, for my as being a neighbor, thanks for letting me see you on a Saturday morning uh, in, this, uh, in this very, very comfortable surroundings. And for the rest of the people, uh, for the folks that are in the audience, there is a whole list of folks on the side that are doing the technical stuff that are keeping us on our toes. Uh, Melody, Paul, and others, thank you so much for supporting us this way. Uh, I, I want to also note that coming up on Thursday, October 8th, you'll find uh, the next program in this series. Uh, and that program takes place at 6 p.m. It's called The History of Racial Terror and Lynchings in Orange County. Uh, on that program, we'll have some of our younger participants, Paris Miller, a scholar and community organizer will present on the history of racial terror lynchings in Orange County. She will be joined by Dr. Seth Koch, who is director of the Southern Oral History Program uh, here at the Center to Study for the Study of the American South at UNC. Plus, uh, and this is important, and I know that our, our guests will appreciate this, the program includes high school students and Freedom Struggle Committee members, Kayla Keaton from Middle Creek High School, Allison Jemerson from Raleigh Charter High School and their teachers, Matt Skildoni and Melanie Winter. And of course, there'll be a question and answer that follows that session. That session will be moderated by Diane Jackson. So 
please visit the website for the Center for the Study of the American South, and you'll be able to get all of that information, and you can continue to keep up. And the, the final word will be donate. Donate to the Ida B. Wells Society. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Go uh, vote. And go <laughs> vote. That's the second, Woo. two most important things coming up. Thanks again to all. Voting is more important. Do, do okay. that if you can only do one. All right. <laughs> all, right. all right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. The sponsors of this event series are Free Spirit Freedom and Mentor North Carolina, Chapel Hill Carborough Branch of the NAACP, Orange County Human Relations Commission, Human Kindness Foundation. Coming to the table, Rogers Eubanks Neighborhood Association, United Church of Chapel Hill, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Center for the Study of the American South, Sonia Haynes Stone Center at UNC Chapel Hill, Center for Civil Rights at the UNC Law School, Orange County Arts Commission, Marion Cheek Jackson Center, Chapel Hill Public Library, Carolina K-12 of Carolina Public Humanities, and members of the Orange County community.